What's up, y'all? This is a video that I did on Twitch. Uh, if you don't know, I stream every Tuesday and Friday on Twitch. Uh, and I walked through, at the request of some of our contributors, I walked through how to contribute to open source the project. So this is gonna walk through forking and cloning and making contributions to the project itself. If you're interested in learning about what open source is, I recommend you check this video. Actually, we'll do this video. And um, that video will actually explain what open source is and how to sort of use it as a user. Um, but if you're interested in contributing, this is the video for you. If you have interest in making contributions open source, this is the project for you. Um, so here we go. So open source, this is what you see when you first see open source. And let's actually jump into starting and forking for the first time. So I'm gonna switch gears and show you how to clone this thing and then walk through some code. And this is one we're switching the dark mode for. All right. So I don't know if I even have a fork of this, to be quite honest. If I do, let's see. Oh, I do. All right. So normally you'd probably just hit the fork button and you're good to go. Uh, and then you create a fork on, on GitHub. Now, this comes up a lot. And I know this might be some insight that maybe not a lot of folks are aware of. But uh, I'm going to actually grab the GitHub CLI link right here. And I'm just going to grab it and copy and paste it right here. I already installed the GitHub CLI on my project, so this will be uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, but the, what I'm going to do is copy that to clone the repo. And there's a reason why, and I'll tell you in a sec. So a lot of times what happens when you clone a repo from GitHub from a fork, um, you get out of sync with the upstream. So if I go to the um, git log, Oop, I should go to CD and open source. All right, so now I'm in the repo. And if I go to git log, uh, one thing I already know off the bat, because I haven't even touched this thing, is that the branch name is master. And if you look at the um, if you look at the upstream, oh, why is this forked from Sean? All right, so this is going to be even more of a problem. I'm forking from a fork, and that's not okay. But let me still move on with the ex explanation. So git remote dash v <coughs> dash v oh boy we can get this today all right so the upstream itself is sean which i'm going to change in a sec and then my main branch is b uh i'm going to change this from sean from open source so give me a sec to change my dot git config uh, and this is a config to basically change my local repo git settings uh, and I don't want this to be Sean. Sean was working on something. Um, actually, it's, the, it's those of you saw the Remarer PR. Um, he was working on that and I was testing it locally, but I had to test it from his branch. So what I'm gonna do is change that from Sean to open source. Because open source, open source is the true upstream. Um, so I'm gonna basically just fix that for now. Um, so this is where all the content comes from. What I want to do now, and this is something that if you're out of sync with the main project, the best thing you could do is type in git fetch upstream. And the reason why I'm doing upstream is because this remote that points to open source, open source, if you use GitHub CLI and clone it that way, it will create an upstream for you. And it makes it so much easier. So git fetch upstream. And I'll grab all the contents that I haven't updated in forever. Because if you go back to my repo, the last commit I had was, oh boy, two years ago. <laughs> so this thing is really out of date. So this will help you no matter what, just in the context, fetching from a stream. Uh, so now what's happened is I should be able to check out the main branch. Oop, get. Oh, you know what? I, um, I fetched it, but I don't have the main branch. Check out the main. And then I could pull uh, upstream main. And hopefully I'll rewrite the history. And it did. So basically, 
two years of changes have now been added onto my local project. So if you get out of date a week, get out of date a year or two years, 10 years, for the most part, it should work if you clean it, if you keep your main default branch, which we do at open source. <laughs> We at open source, we keep our default branch clean as a whistle. Um, it sounds like a some marketing, but it's true. I would not have been able to do that if I let everybody contribute directly to the main branch. It would get so out of whack. So because it's in pristine condition, I was able to do that. So now we are we are up to date. So the other thing I could probably do is get branch delete main because I don't, or sorry, master. Because uh, I don't need that branch anymore. That was two years old. I might as well not even touch that because now the default branch is main. The other thing I'm going to do is push main to the origin. Cool. So with that now intact, the one thing that I'm going to do is now I have, whoops, main branch here. So now you can see I've got stuff from all the way up to 12 days ago. And everything's sort of up to date. I did all that because I wanted to show if you are contributing to open source, you don't have to delete your repo every time you want to make a new change. You could actually fetch from upstream if you clone it directly from the CLI. Just pull from the upstream, merge that in, you're good to go. Cool. Um, Main had changes less than minutes ago. No, that's what I did. The one thing that though, that I'm really kind of annoyed with, I should probably just get rid of because this is pointing to Sean's repo. So that's not normal. I did that because I just wanted to specifically make changes to Sean's branch. Um, I did all that for nothing because I'm gonna end up deleting this anyway. So let's do this. Bdoggy slash open sauce. And let me in the chat. Let me know in the chat if this has at all been useful so far. Uh, I did want to go ahead and just show off that because it, it comes up a lot. I see it a lot, but I don't. I don't actually say anything because um, I figured if you're just going to do it your way, do what works for you. But if you want to do it a way that's a little cleaner, um, that was an option. All right. So I'm going to do this one more time, uh, but instead of do it from an old to your old branch. I'm gonna do it from scratch. Start with the fork button. I have a ton of other accounts in orgs. Just pick your name if that doesn't come up automatically. If I made the last 10 minutes of video, you would definitely watch it, awesome. I'll probably chop this up into multiple videos because probably this, I've got quite a different gems of insight. <laughs> so far that um, just sort of fetching and pulling from upstream would be super useful. Um, cool. So uh, I used to get remote strategy, but for GitHub apps linked, uh, separate workflow is quicker than to nuke. Yeah, um, very true. I, I'm right there with you. I, I've been doing a lot of work with, um, y'all saw me do the uh, Octoherd stuff last week. Uh, Octoherd is created by Gregor. Gregor has a lot of really cool strategies for maintaining open source. I've been actually using a lot of his strategies um, recently, which is why I started using Octoherd. So um, I've got a lot of insight. I probably, I don't know why I don't do enough open source specific content, uh, but I will in the future for sure. All right, so let me go back to the GitHub CLI, grab that again. Reminder, everything I did before I just deleted. So I'm gonna start from scratch with a new clean fork that's not pointing to Sean's repo. I'm gonna quote this from GitHub. Uh, it's gonna be great. Just wanna go ahead and showcase that Sean's repo. Sorry. I always remember the CD into the um, directory. And now it's pointing to open source. It's pointing to the origin is my repo, the fork. And the other thing is my log. I've got commits from 12 days ago as well. Sorry, that's not 12 days ago. That was yesterday. <laughs> I totally forgot that um, I merged this in from um, that dude. Uh, SMJR. Also, shout out to a loft type. I would highly recommend set up your Git user to no reply. Users.no reply uh, at GitHub or something like that. Because a lot of times when I, go, I open up my Git log, 
I don't want to be exposing people's personal emails. So like highly recommend. And as I say that I see Philip's personal email. So when I make a video, Philip, I'll, I'll blur that out. But because I can technically, if I wanted to go to github.com slash user slash bdougie slash events. And this is like a kind of like new age dev hacker, whatever github.users.bdougie slash events. And I can actually, in your last push events, I could look for email. And you see how I have no reply here. If this was my personal email, this is like a really easy way to find someone's personal email if it's not on GitHub. Uh, I say this for your benefit um, because I know people are using this tactic to find your email and email you random stuff or try to get you to sign up for Bitcoin miners and stuff like that. Do you have a strategy for force pushing your history because technically changing email is not enough historically speaking? Yes. Honestly, changing today would be better than not changing forever. Um, so I don't know about force pushing and changing historic commits. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is just kind of just there in the ether, but I would also like recommend using a different email for, for dev stuff too as well. Uh, maybe I want to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> well, to each your own. I, you might not be getting the benefit. People might be leveraging your own, your resources. The other thing too as well, and shout out to people who put their email here. It's super easy. It's super nice when I want to reach out to somebody in their emails here. I just happen to get a lot of email from people who grab my email from my account. And because I'm a GitHub employee, so I just tend to try to just make it a little harder for po folks to find it. How important is it to keep history commits? Like if you copy the repo locally, then start a new one, just the latest version. Um, I think I personally think it's very important, which is why I force people not to push to the main branch because I would not, I literally just pulled two years worth of data live in front of you. And I've got good internet too as well. So it didn't take that long. Um, but I would have not have been able to do that without merge conflicts if I didn't have pristine history of data. So the best practice for contributing to open source. So we've, we've cloned it here and, um, I guess I can jump into the repo itself. Now with all open source, the first thing you should probably check is the readme because it's going to provide some context on, well, the fact that my Netlify deploy failed is wrong. I should probably fix that. Um, but all this other stuff, it is really valid information. So if you just wanted to figure out what to do when you first start to set up local environments, these are the two things I should probably do. So first things first, npm stall, and I'll let that run. And then this next thing's next, <laughs> next thing's next, um, is I want to npm start. So that's gonna take a second to, to do the npm thing, because it's, it is, it's got a lot of dependencies, but I did want to shout out a couple other things. These are just callouts, just so you know exactly what's happening. You do not have to sign up for a one graph to use open source. Um, how the database works. This will probably change in the future. I might have a proper database that I'm pointing to, but for now that goals template repo, this is what actually powers your data on open source. So I did a whole nother session or section of how all this works and how I'm basically managing the data of this, which I didn't go in great detail, but I'll go into great detail now. If I went to open source that goals, once you sign up for open source, you get a repo that looks like this. And that repo itself keeps a data.json that's powered by a GitHub action. So I briefly showed off uh, the last session of the GitHub action that was running that action runs to then sync this data. So all I need is star count is the only thing I'm displaying, issue count, forks count. And that's really just to display it here. Star count, forks count, issue count. For whatever reason, I've removed it from the UI. I don't know why forks and stars, or sorry, forks and issues are not there. They used to be there. Um, I think UI wise, it just was too busy. It probably should be over here somewhere. Um, but that's besides the point. Um, that data I'm caching in a GitHub repo because of rate limiting. So on open source, something in Graylin, welcome, hello. 
Uh, we're doing a, a quick introduction on how to contribute to open source, uh, which is a project to find your next open source project. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you this little link right here. So with GitHub, there's a rate limit. So depending on how much data you're grabbing from github.com or api.github.com, this number will go down. So this is your personal rate limit. So if you log into open source and you're a contributor, if you hit the back tick, and for the sake of um, explanation, on the keyboard, the back tick is above, on the Mac keyboards, the back tick is above your, your tab um, up in the top corner. So some people aren't aware, but this FYI, it's also, um, that's the back tick, by the way. Cool. So, um, cool. But the, you have to be part of the or open source organization to see this bar up here. If you're not part of the, the open source org, which is, and this is for contributors, and this, this whole session is really for contributors. Um, so if you show up in this list right here, you will be able to see that back tick. If you're not in this list, let me know. Um, we have a triage team and I've been adding people to the triage team for labeling issues, opening issues, um, reviewing PRs. Like that's what the triage team is for. So if you want to see the version of open source, the version of react we're on, how long it took to render the page and to load the page, as well as how many users we have in open source, like all that data is here. Cool. <laughs> Jail codes is coming with a party of 50. So we're going to quit. I said I'd never quit you, but we're gonna have to quit this. Why is my, oop, no, 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 don't cancel. There we go. I hit the wrong button. It's gonna run the test one more time, just for good measure. Sorry, I'm using a Jest Watcher, and it, it actually, to get out of it, you have to queue. It will tell you that. But the other thing I wanted to do is actually go into the code. All right, so we now know how to get open source working locally. I wanna give you a real quick tour of how the repo works. Um, and the biggest part that you probably just wanna know is this is a React app. It's a React app created by Create React App about five and a half years ago. So it's a pretty old React app, but it's pretty up to date. So if that makes sense, it's using hooks, it's using style components, using React Router. So it's using all the stuff that you could probably find in Google and learn from like other tutorials. And that's intentional because I wanted to make, I always want to keep this thing approachable. So speaking of approachable, starting with the index.js, I've got a lot of stuff going on here, but it's pretty straightforward. So I do have this, um, we had a, um, a contributor actually throw this in there uh, and super like this contributor actually did a lot of work and help for this. So like whenever you open up open source, um, you will open up the command line you will see this. So that's how, that's how, if you're interested, that's how it's made. The way that also works, it's grabbing whatever is in the package.lock file uh, and grabbing that version. So that way, if you if you wanna know what version open source we're using, it's here and it's here. Another reminder, if you are not part of the open source organization, which there is pretty much no limitation other than you just have to ask to join the org, um, you will not see this upper bar. This upper bar is really for contribution contributors. So you can have an idea of like page load speed, uh, how many users, as well as rate limiting. I, I kind of touched rate limiting previously, um, but that's pretty much it. Join the team, join the triage team. Uh, triage team is meant for folks to, well, that's, there's no conversation there. Also, if you didn't know that about this, you could actually start a discussion here. So I know Vortex and a couple other folks we really just chat and just and Discord, but like if you started like a little project or maybe built a GitHub action, um, feel free to open up a discussion here. Uh, but for the most part, the discussion for contributors happen here in Discord. Um, and <laughs> this seems kind of out of pocket, but uh, let me just show Discord, and it's this channel. So open sourced con contributors in the Discord. Uh, you can actually find it there. And then we have conversations and all the comments and stuff like that. All right, so that is that, uh, that is that. So this is kind of confusing if you haven't seen uh, a busy React file. But the one thing I wanna point out is that we're using Apollo 
as our GraphQL client. But the way we're using Apollo is we're using OneGraph's Apollo. So this is a, a wrapper around the Apollo client. And the reason for this is because OneGraph provides some nice um, extra features to leveraging GraphQL, like persistent queries. That's something that I could not actually use build open source without persistent queries the way I have it set up. And it was a lifesaver. So uh, highly recommend if you're interested. The reason for OneGraph is OneGraph Auth Guardian. The authentication for getting into open source is powered by this one little feature, this little plugin. Um, this also gives me access to OneGraph.com. You do not need to sign up for OneGraph to use open source, but if you are interested, feel free to sign up. But it, I keep saying but, why am I saying but so much? Um, you can see I have a, a query for repos down here. Where's my up here? How about like fetch, fetch repo query? So I'm gonna go to fetch repo. I don't know why I keep grabbing the wrong stuff. There we go. So this grabs repo data. So if I wanted like uh, stars and I wanted like count, total count, there we go. I'll figure this out. This is GraphQL, by the way, if you have never heard of it. Uh, congratulations this is, if this is your first exposure. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, I don't have access to this because it's a, as I showed previously, it is a GitHub app integration, which doesn't give me access to public data, which is a good, it is a good uh, Viable Clan member. Welcome in X. Thanks for the yo. Um, how much is it? How much is one graph? One graph is free. I don't know if there's actually a paid tier to be quite honest. Let me, uh, I don't have, I have no answers on pricing. There we go. Pricing for open source. It's free for individuals. It's 21, $24 a month. So there you go. And for, I assume it's for like privacy, three common integrations of, uh, uh, we have live, live chat support and stuff like that. So, oh, it's actually coming soon. So their paid tiers are not even available yet. So it's all free at, at the moment. Good question. Oh, I didn't see the prices at the top. Okay. No, no worries. So I wanted to show that because it is something that it might throw you off. It has not even come up in, in question yet at all since the beginning of me doing open source. Um, but just know that that's it. I'm using a config file to sort of pipe in some data here. Uh, this is my app ID. So the app I just showed you in open source, that's what that is. The one graph client, the off, off guardian, this is here. Uh, you can see Sean actually added that two years ago. Um, and this, this is where it really starts getting into the weeds of how the code works. So please ask a lot of questions if this does not make sense, because this is stuff I've been working on for like four years. So, there's a lot of knowledge I have not documented, and my hope is that this video will document that. So that's going to one graph. It's going to a one graph GraphQL API that's built with that app ID. It's this is here so I can quickly swap. Uh, what's probably going to happen here is I want to have a development app ID or something like this. And my hope is to be able to swap this. So if you're running locally, you'll actually hit a different app. You won't hit the production app. Uh, and I want that to be seamless. So that way you don't know what's happening unless you have to fix it. That's the hope. Cool. Sorry. Lunch is coming back for me for a moment. Uh, this is all code. It's not as important, but just note that this is how I'm consuming the GraphQL right here the config.js. Any chance you can get graph the graph on offline? No. <laughs> um, and mainly because I, I'm not doing caching properly. So if I turn off network and stop recording now, how do you turn off the offline mode? <laughs> this used to be something I did all the time for demos and it should be, if y'all know where it is, let me know in the chat. I think it's a, uh, it's in the network tab sources. Nope. Somewhere here in the network, I can turn off. Stop recording, clear, no. How do I turn off the network? Because I can't turn off my Wi-Fi to do this demo because <laughs> that would stop the streaming. 
Um, but I could. What things can OneGraph connect to? Take a <laughs> phone your ISP cancel. <laughs> yes, please. Internet, please turn off for a second. Um, yeah, I don't want to break the stream, but I just want to point out that it is caching stars data, but it's pulling it from GitHub. So I don't have caching set up properly. That is something, if you want to open an issue, I would love you forever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, please. Disable the cache. Well, I don't want to disable the cache. I want to use the cache and show what's actually being cached. So there used to be a way to be able to just uh, turn off network to simulate the cache working. Application, I'll Google this. Turn off network. <laughs> Testing Twitch offline. Turn off network um, Chrome. Disable the internet connection, work offline. Should be offline. Oh, it's a drop down. Did they put it into a drop down? There we go. No, this is throttling. Offline. There we go. All right. So now if I refresh with the tab open, you see <laughs> absolutely nothing works. So it'd be great to actually set this up. One, fix the service worker so that way you at least see something. Um, I think what actually what it's caching is a homepage. So the homepage would work offline. Let me turn that back on. But yeah, that was a great question because I just realized um, that that's not working offline. So that'd be great to fix. Uh, but again, this is all open source. My hope is that we could um, eventually st fix a lot of the stuff, learn together, or if not, I'll probably just spend my weekends doing this myself. All right, so this is what the service worker is doing right now. It's actually, it's displaying all this offline, but I'm not mocking any any data. So this is the only page that works offline right here. And even the favicon, it's not even, that should probably get fixed. Wow, there are so many issues um, <laughs> that I've discovered just doing this walkthrough. I'm so glad I'm doing this right now. And I hope that everybody who's on the stream, you're getting some value out of this as well. Just looking at an existing project and how it works. All right, so let's turn this back on. <laughs> let's go to fast 3G. The one thing that's annoying is, actually, it's not bad anymore. You get a little bit of flicker. Um, I'll turn it off. We'll go back in. And honestly, we're supposed to be in local host the whole time anyway. All right, so that's open source. Uh, that's how that works. I want to talk about how we're getting data from GitHub and connect that one graph piece again. So if you go into the lib and you go to API GraphQL.js, you see all these GraphQL queries. And the way this is working is that it's creating a GraphQL doc. Uh, it's called the operations doc. And I, I barely scratched the surface of even mentioning this, but when I was talking about how GraphQL is being consumed, it's got the one graph Apollo client here, and then it's gonna consume the doc in the config.js. So the operation doc right here, it's getting passed in as an argument, and then it's passing itself as a query back to OneGraph. So as a quick reminder, OneGraph looks like this. Uh, this is the dashboard. What I would love to have, I really need to sit and watch this video and open a ton of issues just on this one video alone. I would love to bring this to here. So if I went to OneGraph opensauce.pizza and typed it like GraphQL, it'd be great to have OneGraph directly here in the browser as opposed to like going back and forth here to here to test things out. So that's one thing I do want to add and I probably will open up an issue for it. Um, but hopefully that makes sense. We're taking all the GraphQL queries that I have here in the lib. Let's go to API GraphQL and uh, we're just consuming it all into one GraphQL query. Oh, you can assign me to that right straight away. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, if you're, if you're ready to work, ready to jump on this, I would love to help. Uh, I have a couple more things I have to do work-wise before I can really jump feet first and back into this. Um, that basically some other projects are taking up so much more of my time and I'll be looking forward to uh, sharing those projects soon. Um, but yeah, these are all GraphQL queries. So like that fetch repo query, repo query, 
do, 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 do. Actually, it's called repo query. So if I go up to repo query, that is this. And this repo query is basically grabbing all this data, my description, my full name, name of owner, uh, whether or not you have issues enabled, true or false, the owner description again, wait, that's twice. I found another issue. <laughs> if anybody wants to open up issues, um, the best place to go is opensauce.pizza. Uh, you could open an issue, you could have a contribution in less than less than 30 minutes probably. Um, man, that is awful. This is literally there twice and it should be there once. But it is what it is. Wait, who added this? Uh, Yogi added it 10 months ago. Uh, that's why. Even though it was there, it got added again. And I missed that in code review, which is why we have a triage room team. In my opinion, the best way to steer contributions to make the project so inclusive you essentially contribute to it before being done the, the tutorial. Satisfied with the new things you discovered. Yes. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, okay, so let me get out of this uh, search. And, but this repo query, I, I, wanna, I wanna show you the life cycle of this query. So let me go back to the search, go back down here. Uh, and I have this little um, fetch for re fetch repo query. I want to show you how this is working. It's basically taking this fetch one graph uh, function, which is actually being exported from here, which again is taking the operations doc operation name and some variables, stringifying it and sending it to one graph and producing data from GitHub. So that's how that's working. So each one of these um, functions that call a specific query is doing it in this way. I'm also passing in variables here, uh, just FYI. I'm then going down here and exporting it uh, as an object called API. And this will be important. They couldn't get everybody to try. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was like uh, with me at Redwood. I'm pushing typo fixes and stuff, yeah. Yeah, that, that's honestly, I'm just throwing so many underhand pitches. If y'all want to save this for Hacktoberfest, you could have a t-shirt in no time. Um, so I'm exporting this as an, an entire object called API. And this is a practice I used when I was at Netlify. I don't know how people, if people like this, what I don't really want is like large sweeping changes on decisions on how you write code. Um, if there's a better use case on how to use this and export this data and stuff like that, I'm happy to hear it in, in a discussion probably. Um, but yeah, this is this is how it works. Now, I've, I've, I mentioned I have React hooks as a the way this, this app is consuming data. Uh, and I'm importing it here on line two inside of my hooks.js. So if you wanna see where all the hooks are, this is where all the hooks are. I've only got two. So I've got this, this hook which is using a tool called SWR, built by Vercel, it's an open source project. And that gives me caching. The problem is what you just saw, that caching does not cache offline. So if anybody has that seen that as a solved problem, I am all ears. I haven't had time to really dig into it, but it does give me cache on reload. Uh, it doesn't give me cache for offline though. Uh, is it open source? Oh, sorry, what is... Uh... Dude, I'm actually starting to write a Red Bull book. Oh, nice. Um, good luck with that. I'm looking forward to, to actually hearing that. You've got a lot of context on Redwood. Uh, the other thing I do want to point out, I am using React Suspense. React Suspense is something that it doesn't really, it's an experimental and it's been something that's not really available, but I had a use case for Suspense and I really wanted to use it. So now I'm basically in the experimental track. Uh, and to sort of show off expense real quick, the way expense works is whenever you go into a repo, you get a little spinner. Uh, that's what suspense is doing for me. You see all this little spinning and loading? Suspense is loading this stuff um, asynchronously while you're seeing stuff on the page. It was so easy to implement it with suspense that I was like, I'm just gonna use suspense because the way I was doing it before is like, it was kind of like the, it's like the, I, I've been in React since like the almost the beginning. I've learned a lot of bad practices and how to write React. 
I've cleaned up this entire repo and I'm using a lot of modern practices to the extent that I'm using suspense, which is an experimental feature in React. Cool. So I have a hook. It's using SWR to basically um, persist some state um, on refresh. So basically all the data you see on the page, I want to persist that whenever you hit refresh or change from hit the back bug and stuff like that. So that's what this is. If you are familiar with things like Redux or the Context API, this will be familiar. If you are not, um, there's not really a need to touch it because this stuff's tested and uh, it's good to go and it just works. Now, if we want to improve the offline experience, we'll probably have to touch the hooks.js to make that work. Um, but this FYI, the lib folder actually is inclusive of things like that thing where I showed you getting the app version. So this little tiny uh, v.0.18.3, that is a, a little lib file. I could create it as a, a NPM package, but it's all good. Um, let's see, humanized numbers, all the numbers that you see on the, on the, the project, like right here, it's getting wrapped with a humanization. So when it comes from the GitHub API, it has no commas. Um, that's how I make commas <laughs> is with that little lib. So this is a humanized number right here. Uh, and I should probably say humanize for Americans because I know not everybody uses commas to denote thousands and stuff like that. So humanized numbers for Americans or westernized civilization at least. Um, there we go. Here's a test. Uh, my test files and my lib folder, they all are co-located and this is intentional because I want to be able to like, if I wanted to take this and make its own NPM package, the test in the package would go on for a ride in its own repo. This is such, this is a practice I did at Netlify. Um, so I'm going to talk about Netlify a lot because this project itself was built when I worked at Netlify. So a lot of the stuff I use here is literally how Netlify was writing code because I wrote all the code. Um, so this is kind of like exposing a lot of that early code. If you work at Netlify as an engineer and you're curious of like why stuff are certain ways and why I touched it, just look at open source and it'll give you all the answers. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to show off is the, uh, the way JWTs work. It's also a lib folder. It's also tested uh, as well. Uh, but this is how I'm basically getting a token from GitHub as a JWT to not expose it to the wild. Um, that's how we're doing it here. If you're at all interested, definitely check out the lib folder. It's got all the sort of helper packages. Uh, all the illustrations, all the SVGs on open source, they all live. All these illustrations, I actually got from like kind of like an unsplash, but for illustrations, they're all generic. I got them from a place and I don't remember. To be quite, oh, actually, undraw. All the illustrations currently come from undraw so if you're if you're interested in uh supporting this project or getting open source illustrations uh this is the place i got them all from so fyi just thought i, I mentioned that because i think it'd be useful for folks um images is pretty self-explanatory gucci it got b-duggy got face which i don't know what that is but um logos um that's, that's what the open source logo is. I don't know why there's only one logo in there, though. Um, now we get into nitty, some more nitty gritty. The entire CSS for this project is style components. Um, so if you look at this card.js, um, this is all style components. And the way this works, which I haven't gotten the actual code yet, um, if I grab a component and I go into card, um, you can see I've got this little wrapper and I'm, I'm big in the wrap. Um, I've got a fitted card and I've got a card card and I'm importing this from styles slash card. So if you're at all interested in how the CSS, if you're going to work on any CSS for this project, it's all style components. Um, and if I went back to my style components, which I had open, my card JS has a card and it then should have a um, fitted card. And then the fitted card basically just takes the padding and it just takes down the, the zero. Um, for example, of a fitted card, I think 
Honestly, I don't even know where a fitted card is. I should probably know this. I think this fitted card is actually a card that has no... No, it's not the margin. Anyway, you'll find fitted cards throughout the um, the app. I should probably enter Stitch a whatever a fitted card is. Um, the other thing I should probably do as well is open up design that open source because that'll actually answer the question. So I haven't touched this yet. This is style components. Style components has all the components that exist. So if I wanted to find this, so this is a current problem with style components is that like things like fitted card and card, they don't exist in the context that they should. So I'm pretty sure a fitted card is the note card where I have notes. Nope, that's not it. Honestly, I don't know where I'm using fitted cards in. Let me, uh, fitted card. How do I search the entire project? Uh, you can make a few chapters available to read online. The pool, the firewall, the advanced stuff, paid wall. That's a good idea. Vortex, you've got a lot of business sense. <laughs> Just saying. You have, a, you have a lot of great ideas. Um... Oh, I do have a fitted card component. Well, this gives me an idea to share style components. So right now I am in the style components, which I'm struggling to, uh, how do I get rid of the search box? There we go, go back to this. Uh, I've got these stories, a stories folder. And in those stories, I've got seven stories showing off different functionalities of the app. These are a way for me to ex explain different features uh, and different UI elements. So I've got a fitted card component and the way it works is it passes in an argument called fitted. And this has changed. So this is, I'll just say this right now, this, all the storybook stuff is completely out of date. Um, and what story is this? Primitive stories. Ah, uh, there we go. Here's my fitted card. So fitted card basically has no, no inner padding. This is not a great example, but there were use cases. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a fitted card, this right here. So basically I have a list, but I wanted to, I wanted to have zero padding within the list. Um, not a great explanation, but if you see this, um, this list right here, it goes right up the edge. I needed padding zero basically inside this outer card to make this list work. So that's how that, that works. This is, let me know if let me know if this is too minute of details. Um, at this point, I don't even know what I'm actually explaining. I had a list up. Storybook, style components. I covered it, sort of. You could probably dig in pretty closely to find out more style components and play around with it and break it. If you clone this locally, you're not gonna break anything. I talked about authentication, I talked about the GraphQL. Did I talk about the GraphQL API? No. I talk about consuming data and caching with reducers, which is the hooks, hooks JS, and then making contributions. Did I literally just go through the entire list without even looking at it once? Working here 20 years gives you a lot of insight because language is barriers. Yeah, create online consists of parts of the world. Excellent. Um, sorry, I'm like, y'all having a conversation about um, Anthony's future book. And I actually completely talked about everything. So, I mean, that is open source in a nutshell. Uh, style components is like probably the biggest hurdle if you haven't touched it too as well. Between consuming GraphQL and style components, those are big hurdles. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Um, let me talk about the, the router because uh, this will actually give me a, a good sense to be able to tell you how complicated it is. It's not that complicated. So if I go into source, I show, so far I just showed it off uh, just a couple different components. Danger, danger zone is the um, the warning modal if you try to delete the repo. I've got like my footer, like some like one-off stuff. Uh, that's for the header. The hero card, which is, I don't know if that's still used in modern development, but this is my hero context card right here. Um, it's just like the, the giant above the fold box. Um, what else? Contributions.js. This is a uh, contribution box is this over here on the right. So it just gives you some extra context to the project. 
I've got some like uh, issue list items. So all of this right here is this box down here. Um, this right here is, this is my, honestly, I don't even know what it's called, that's called. I do have a modal. So if you do want to do anything with modals that exist, uh, repo list item, repo list items are this. Uh, it's actually just, this is a repo list item, just one. So like, if you wanted some underhand pitches, con contributions, just going through these stories and updating them to actual examples that are mod like up to date. For example, like this gradient background, we could just delete this. I'm not using this anywhere. It was like in my early, earliest mockups that I made on my own, I had a gradient background for some reason. It was actually, I know why, three years ago, it was actually pretty popular to have a background get gradient. They were a pain to manage and create myself in code, so I never used it. Um, this little profile avatar, that's what's up in the upper right hand corner. But the stories will actually help dictate you into a place where you kind of understand the rest of the project. So I hope that was useful. Uh, I don't know if I have much else to explain other than GraphQL stuff, which I did break it. I break, I broke out the, um, the lib folder a bit. So that kind of exposed you to how the queries worked. I also created a query live, um, the majority of the projects using Flexbox. So you can see that here. I am using a grid column, which honestly, I don't even know what I'm using that for. I can't remember. This was fun. Thanks for uh, encouraging the stream, Vortex, sitting and chat with, chatting with me. If you have interest in making contributions open source, this is the project for you. If you want to learn about other projects, this is the project for you. Stop by the Discord, stop by the issues, ask questions. Uh, the best way to learn about the project, learn how to do open source is by asking questions. So I encourage you to do so. Also, I'm gonna shout out the fact that because of this video, we now have tons of Good First Issues. I said tons, but I really meant five. But um, yeah, check out the Good First Issue label um, and jump in there. Anything unassigned, uh, it's up for grabs. Uh, if you have any ideas or any thoughts or features uh, for opensauce.pizza, please let me know as well. Stay saucy, y'all.